Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Ginny Worley Hemeter. Today we have the pleasure of being visited by Teresa Schwiegel, author of The Lies We Tell. This is a great crime novel about a Chicago cop who has a secret and is trying to protect her little family. Welcome so much to Anderson's Bookshop. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Thank, Thank you, you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Um, let's jump into your debut novel was Officer Down, and that won you an Edgar Award and quite a bit of critical praise, which is very exciting for you. Um, this is your sixth book, yes. The Lies We Tell, and you've gotten great praise from other reviews on that, so congratulations. Thank you very much. Of that. But you didn't actually start your career as a writer, is that correct? Uh, well. I mean, I was a personal trainer, I was a bartender, I was a intern, <laughs> it was all sorts of things. <laughs> right. But no, I didn't start out as a writer. Um, I found my way there um, after going to film school and trying to be a screenwriter and uh, never having any luck there. Right. Um, I had a professor in college, his name is Leonard Schrader. He, um, convinced me that I didn't know what I was doing screenwriting, but that I had a voice and, and agreed to work separately with me on, on trying to write a novel version of the screenplay, which became Officer Down, the novel. Okay. Um, so how does your background in film shape your writing now, do you think? I think it helps me with structure, because I'm, I'm actually pretty terrible at plot. It takes me a long time. Like if you see my, my outlines, they're just always torn apart <laughs> because I can't ever get the characters to do what I had originally planned. Um, I think that having that sort of gives me a road map for the structure of of whatever I'm writing because in screenwriting there's you know something has to happen on page two page seven page 22 to keep the audience engaged and and so that is uh, what helps me okay so you mentioned you have an outline is that how you normally work with an outline and a plan or do you kind of just start with an idea and see where it takes you both both I think before I start writing I have an idea an idea and I let it just kind of sit or fester and then um, when I'm ready to write I, I usually try to outline but again by the time I get halfway through or so I have no idea what I was thinking <laughs> when I started <laughs> so it always changes quite a bit. Right okay what is your earliest recollection of wanting to be a writer either for screen or on the page or in some sort? I don't really remember wanting to write, I don't believe I knew exactly what that meant, but, but I always was writing. When I was in, like, I think, first grade, I wrote The Unicorn's Lost Horn, which was one, it won, like, the school, whatever, the little school competition. Yeah, and, yeah. and then, I, it's funny, I had a, an old high school friend of mine, she um, reached out to me and showed me this book of poetry that in eighth grade, I, I won first place in poetry for District 300. Wow. <laughs> you should see the poems they are. Terrible. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad I didn't try to be a poet. Poetry is hard. <laughs> oh man, it's so hard. I guess that's how I feel about short stories too. I mean, mm. I think the forms are so, are so complicated, so much more complicated when you have less space to, right. say, to say things. Right, to be really compact. Right. To be very crafty with your form that mm -hmm. way. I, I understand that. Um, well, I was going to ask about the first piece that you wrote. So The Unicorn's Last Horn, yes, do you still have it? I do, I do. And I did my own illustrations, which were probably... Yes. Uh, not as I'm glad I didn't become an artist. Either, put it that way. <laughs> Where's it in those little the little binding that they used to do in elementary school, the little plastic roll? Of the yeah. Binding. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then I had well. like the unicorn, kind of looks like a dog with a, it's it's pretty rough, but it has four legs <laughs> right. and a body and, it and a horn. Yes, exactly. The important part. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, do you feel like you write for a specific genre on purpose, or do you just write the stories that are sort of already inside you? Um, well. M Officer Down came from a, um, a dear friend of mine who was uh, sort of having a similar experience. There's an affair that's going on, and and um, and I was really interested in, in what that meant and, and why somebody would would engage in something like that. And and so for me, that was the fact that the character was a cop was kind of beside the point. It was just I always say. The crime's kind of a backdrop for me to to let all these characters figure out their personal stuff, um, and so then when the book got published, then it was just like, well, now I now you write about cops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so six books later, now I write about cops. Right. It's funny people have asked me about 
you know, well, how could you write a man? How could you write somebody that you, you know, characters that you may not know? And I'm like, well, nobody criticizes my, that I write about cops. <laughs> I know far less about them than I do um, about personal, the personal stuff I write about. Right, right. What I was going to ask is that you do have both female and male protagonists in your book. Um, was that a choice to do that both? And how did you prepare to do those? Do you feel like you do them differently? Yeah, I think I, I do them differently. Um, I, you know, for me it was like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing a series, and so I'm not going to write about six different female cops. I just don't feel like that's a that's real in, mm -hmm. the, in the world, I feel like. Um, and I also was really interested in the dynamic of relationships, particularly with male officers. My, my third book, Person of Interest, was about a marriage, really, about the, the other, there were two protagonists, the cop and then his wife. Um, and so it just made more sense to me to write a male in that case. I don't know, did I answer your question? Well, sure, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's a choice. I think when you have a, sometimes there's a character in your brain already, right? And they yeah. sort of already have a voice and you can kind of really tell who they are. But I would imagine that there are times when there's a story and then the character is to your development. Right. So then, you yeah. Know, well, I've been lucky. My publisher has let me do whatever I want, basically, um, in terms of if I'm writing a male or a female or if I'm writing standalones. Um, right now, the one that's sitting in my brain is is a guy, so we'll see. Yes, we'll see. Well, the happens. other thing that's interesting is that um, characters from your other books tend to pop up. Yeah. In the other books again, so yeah. it's not quite a series, exactly. Right. But so, it's the same world. Right. Yeah. Yes, and obviously set here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know the location. It was fun as reading it to see all the different places, but I know where that is. Oh, right. Which is really great. Um, Although my last book, I wrote about the good boy. Um, it was about a boy who stole his father's canine and ran away in the city. And so I have a ton of city stuff in there, but a lot of it. I actually walked the route that he, that he, that he went. It was like eight miles or something with, with my dogs just to see what it would be like. And I was just thinking the other day, I'm like, oh, that one scene that I wrote, that's not even there anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so many things are changing. Changes, but right. I feel like, I think George Pelicano says he likes to put a, a t like a, it's almost like a timestamp on the stuff that mm -hmm. he writes by, by writing what's actually there when he does it. Right. And I think that's pretty cool. A testament to it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Is it, um, so talk about the choice of bringing the characters back and that sort of continuing their stories almost. And mm -hmm. is that they just won't leave your brain or um, do your fans ask for that? Um, I think, well, for, for this book, I brought back Ray Weiss. He was the protagonist mm -hmm. in my second book, Probable Cause. And I don't, honestly, I just always liked that guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I felt like I didn't finish his story necessarily because he's a rookie in that book, and I wanted to I wanted to see what he would what he would do, what he would be like now. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, so I, I limit. I am new to your novels, but I was really intrigued by the character of Gina Simonetti, um, her family, and and the secrets that she keeps. Where can you talk about the germs of the seeds of that story? How yes. did it start? Uh, that began when shortly after my first daughter was born, and my mom got sick, and she was in the hospital. She was at Northwestern for a month, mm. and nobody knew what was wrong with her. And she was unconscious half the time, and she was confused, and she, um, it was tough. I mean, they never actually figured out what was wrong with her. Uh, but I would bring my daughter there all the, every chance we could, and I just noticed the this, this striking difference between the way the staff treated my mom and my daughter. And, and it was a language thing for me, because my daughter was learning how to speak, and my mom was trying to remember how to speak. Mm -hmm. And it was just a t two different two different worlds it felt like um, and so I wanted to write about that I wanted to put a, a character in a situation where she was dealing with somebody who she was somebody young and somebody older mm -hmm. and and figure out um, how to talk I want I wanted to figure out how to talk about the res the difference in respect because mm -hmm. um, I found it really sort of insulting that that I didn't feel my mom was being respected. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, you know, you read the book, you, you know, it's about elder care and, mm -hmm. and the way that an older person is, is treated when they're ill. In this case, a mental thing, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I started writing, that was just a choice because I liked the neurological connection between having a, a main character who has MS and then this woman who has Alzheimer's. As I was writing, 
my uncle was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so that, then that became very personal for me and I wanted to, to, to do that justice as well. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of hard situations yeah. at once. Yeah. So, so you had a lot of that sort of family experience um, already. Did you have any other research that you felt like you needed to do for this book, this story, this character? Well, I always have to do the cop stuff. I always have to find somebody who would know how all that would be handled. And usually, <laughs> it just makes me mad because I'm like that does like I can't do it that way. It's not interesting, you know. Yeah. Um, I have to take the character off the grid. I have to take the cop off the grid, or have them do do something that you know they normally wouldn't be allowed Break to do. The rules. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, I have a, a couple of go-to cop friends who will who will help, and um, and then it's just just a matter of going back to that outline and trying to figure out what I was thinking <laughs> right. when I started. It's this great idea. Um, there's actually, well, in the book, it's, the hospital's called Sacred Heart, and that hospital did exist. And if you Google the, I mean, that's pretty much where I got the, the plot of the story. Mm, okay. Um, was there some cor corrupt stuff going on at that, at that hospital. Okay. So. Um, is anything else in the book based on your own experiences? Yes, well, I have MS. <laughs> which you just so there's that shared right? I did yes. yeah which I hadn't shared before um, because well listen I didn't even tell my publisher I was pregnant I just didn't feel, <laughs> feel like those things were relevant like my personal sure. life was relevant to the business of writing sure. but when all these um, events were kind of circling around each other I thought well you know really if I can I'm, I'm certainly not going to sell books by saying I have I have MS, but if I can be relatable, if I can let people know that there are other ways to handle bad situations, that if I can talk about um, how I deal with 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 the disease and mm -hmm. and show you know like probably the Gina does not deal with, <laughs> with it very well. Um, not that was taking your medication. That was my yeah, right. That was well. I don't take medication either. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I I kind of put her in a position where she was doing some other things she shouldn't be doing you mm -hmm. know so um, I didn't have to do much research there she was pretty easy <laughs> easy right. to write right 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 um, so in relation to your comment about the Sacred Heart and the hospital that, mm -hmm. that actually did go through quite a bit of, of um, scandal that way when I read the book I felt like it took a pretty hard stance on a lot of those health care issues as it relates to folks who can't pay or folks who sort of are opportune for being taken advantage of. Did you write it as an, an, with an intention of sharing that experience of sort of sh that's taking that stance or is that just kind of the result of your research and the specific instances of the characters? Well I would say both. I think I think in the writing and in everything that was going on, I developed a hard stance against how um, how people can be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And you know, in my experience, um, I, I just I've felt victimized before. Certainly not. I mean, even when I when I was pregnant, I felt victimized. My daughter, my first daughter, had a had a. They thought she had a heart condition when she was when I was pregnant with her. And they had all these, you know, it was just like this big freak out thing where that was overblown and made me feel like I had no control. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I kind of feel like that happens quite a bit. That that when as soon as as soon as you go medical, you you are a victim of whatever's happening to you. And it, that right. that I don't think that's right. Right, right. There seem like there are a lot of elements of this book that are that are more personal to you perhaps than some of your others. Would you say this is the most personal of your books, either because of the MS connection or um, the hospital connections with your experiences? I would, yes, perhaps it's the most personal, but I think, I really, I still think that my earlier books are more me, the, mm. the voice is more me. Um, cause I, maybe because I didn't know what I was doing when I was writing <laughs> my first books, but, but those, those first two particularly feel like, um, more of the, they express my attitude more clearly mm. like I feel like I'm more diplomatic now or, or more reserved even in my writing okay is that a do you think that's like a, that's a choice do you think that's coming from your experience or what has led you to that I maybe it's maybe it's just having kids mm. I think that's changed my perspective quite a bit 
Um, I think I'm more protective now mm -hmm. of myself and my family, and 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 maybe I'm hesitant to, you know, put put things out there like I usually would. Mm -hmm. Well, the character of Isabella is so sweet, and that oh. relationship with her and Gina Thank was you. so sweet to read. And they're they're clear, you know, she's an aunt, but really for her, she's the only mom she's ever known. Yeah. Um, and their little nest that they would go. They had such sweet. Um, well, thank you for saying that because I, I had to cut a lot of that out because I felt like I was being a little too precious at times. Well, uh, I think yeah. I mean that's. Uh, I mean, reading it and knowing where some of the action was going to head in that vein, I kind of had to hold my breath. You right, know? Um, right. And you know that there were going to be some hard choices there, but um, her character I thought was was very sweet. But again, as a mom, that just sort of happens to you, right? Like, right, <laughs> right. You can't do it that way. Yes. Um, so when you were writing, do you have a group, a writing group, or a critiquing group? I do not. I did when <clears throat> I lived in California, and it was they were really helpful. I do not have one here. Um, which is okay. I think at this point, I, I pretty much figure out what I screw up anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I just reread something. I mean, writing is rewriting, right? Um, but no, I don't. I, I have a couple friends that that who will read my early stuff, and mm -hmm. but it's more just so that I can put it out there and be like, okay, I did this. It's probably terrible, but I. I'm never going to move on unless I know somebody else has it. When there's a great community of, of crime and, and mystery writers here in Chicago um, that I know you're, you're friends with, you, what would you say are your current influences of other writers that you may work with? Oh boy, my current influences. You know, to be honest, I read a lot of nonfiction now when I can. Um, I'm kind of more interested. I'm I, Lately I've been interested in bad guys and how to do that well because that's always been hard for me I can never it's okay if I can write a thief or you know somebody who's not going to actually hurt someone else but um, but that's really hard for me and so um, I've been reading this Graham Wood book about his he, he went in and um, researched ISIS and he was there with them and he was talking about getting into the mindset of of people that are in, in that organization. So like that's the stuff that's fascinating to me now. Mm -hmm. um, I did read Michael Connelly's latest book and I mm -hmm. loved it because he had a female character and I wanted to see what he would do with her. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I don't, you know, I don't sadly hang out in Chicago <laughs> with other writers because <laughs> I'm usually in bed by nine o'clock. Yes. <laughs> Another lovely side effect of well, I just, kids, right? a lovely yeah. side effect of a one-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, what about previous in, uh, influences you, on you as far as writers go? Uh, I would say um, I mentioned George Pelicanos before. Mm -hmm. I think he's really great. You mentioned your professor. Oh yeah. So Tra Leonard Trader. Yeah. He's a, f a filmmaker. He did Kiss of the Spider Woman mm -hmm. a long time ago. Um, yeah. He he was a great a great storyteller. I mean, even in his class, it was. It was I always looked forward to it because I knew that he was going to tell some stories, but you know, yeah. um, some people are very good at that. I'm, I'm actually not too good at just telling a story. I'm better on paper. Right, right. Okay. Um, so you are writing at a time when social media is obviously quite pre prevalent. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like your readers interact with you on social media or how has technology changed the way that you connect with your readers? Well, I'm terrible at <laughs> social media. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I feel like, I suppose I feel like readers now think that they have more ability to get in touch with writers and so it's, it's more relatable in that way. Um, so, so that's good. I mean, but other than that, not much has changed for me. I, I it's kind of painful for me <laughs> to have to post stuff all the time, and, right. and it's also again my my time in life with my kids, and um, I don't I don't choose to spend much time doing that. But I think for a lot of writers, I think everything being available online has changed mm -hmm. for research, for books, book buying, mm -hmm. you know, for, and just for finding the things that that you're interested in. Right. Yeah. What does your writing um, schedule look like? Do you have one? Do you always write at the same time? Do you write in a certain place? Um, I don't have a schedule. I write when I can, really. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm if I'm crunching to get something done, I'll I'll just work all the way through. You know, I'll just mm -hmm. get babysitters and keep going. But otherwise, right. other than that, it's like nap time, bedtime. I just right. do it when I can. I actually prefer to write at night. Okay. But 
um, again, that nine o'clock bedtime really messes it yes. up for me lately. <laughs> Um, I'm not working. I'm working on a screenplay right now, so and that that's um, really fun because it's collaborative and it's also something I feel like I know what I'm doing and and um, and it's kind of it's kind of set for me. It, mm. it wasn't it wasn't my idea, which is great because that's usually the hardest part for me is the idea. Yeah. Um, so the execution is is what's fun. Is there a specific place in your house or? Outside oh, I have a I like? have an office in my house. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a standing desk because I can't. I don't like sitting down. I feel like my brain sits down with me. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's my space. I have um, a picture of the um, Chicago Public Library Foundation uh, gala where I was. Um, the 21st Century Award yeah, winner, That's yeah, right. years ago, but but the one that I kept was the one with Don DeLillo because I was like, I am in the same picture <laughs> with Don DeLillo, so that's right there on the wall. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned you're working on a screenplay. Any tidbits about that or any other projects that you're working on that you can share with us? Well, that's the only project I'm working on right now. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's with Steve James. He's the director. He's primarily does documentaries, but he did Hoop Dreams, sure. The Interrupters, which I thought was very good, the Roger Ebert um, movie. And he wanted to do a narrative about um, a post-Ferguson, about w what happens in Chicago when an off-duty police officer shoots and kills mm -hmm. a homeless man. And, the, and so we're kind of, we're going to try to do the Rashomon version of that and have everybody's perspective. but. And then at one point, the script was all about the state's attorney, assistant state's attorney. He was the protagonist. He's not even in the script anymore. So <laughs> it's changed quite a bit. Changed. But um, but I've mostly been interested in the police officer and his family and what happens when, you know, all eyes are on that mistake. Mm -hmm. or, or and, and, and was it a mistake? Um, so that's been really, we've had a lot of great conversations about that. Sounds really exciting. Yeah, interesting. yeah, it's really interesting. That's awesome. Talking about the screenplay you're working on, would you ever be interested in having any of your works translated to either the small or big screen? Oh, absolutely. Would you want show to be me the involved? money? <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes I know authors either want to be involved in like a screenplay for that, or maybe wouldn't be. What would you? Oh, I think be? I would. I think I would. I think it Given would be your background, fun. of yeah. course, that would make sense. But yeah. which one do you think would make the leap the easiest? Mm. I don't know. I think it would be, I think that, um, well, I, I know I was talking to you earlier about how some things just aren't smart to film. Like, probably nobody's going to want to make a movie about a protagonist who has MS. It's just not that glamorous. The book before that, nobody wants to make a movie with a boy and a dog. That's just like, nobody wants to <laughs> wrang be a dog wrangler. Um, so backing up before that, I think that um, probably Person of Interest, which was the one with the the police officer, he's like trying to infiltrate this Chinese gang and, mm -hmm. and his wife thinks that he's having an affair. I think that would be, be probably a pretty, pretty good he said, she said script. Yeah. Okay. Do you have other favorite book to screen adaptations outside uh, your genre? Or outside my genre. Could be within. That would be okay too. Mm. None that I can think of off the top of my head. Or even, you know, some TV. I know Michael Connelly's obviously. Oh, yeah. That can TV and, John Bosch. Yeah. And film mm -hmm. um, for Lincoln Lawyer, but there have been other. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like Bosch. I thought I was not. I, I thought, oh, I don't know. How can you do that with all of those books? How are you ever mm -hmm. going to figure it out? But they've done a really great job, and, the, and that Titus Welliver is great. So, um, other, than, other than that, I can't think of too many adaptations that I've. I'm like looking at these books over here as if I'm gonna find what yes <laughs> spark spark my spark an idea. Yes, well, so your dime is limited too with uh, you know your kids, so you're probably right. not watching a lot right. of although I've been hardcore crime no, no, TV I've been, shows. I've been watching Bloodline. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's okay. Talk about I'm fascinated by that bad guy. Right. So yeah. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move into our lightning round now, which is sort of rapid fire, quick answers off the top of your head. Some book related, some not so much. All right. um, what were your favorite books when you were a child? Oof. Other than the unicorns. The, yeah, well yes. that was my own work, right. of yes. course. So. <laughs> um, you know, I can tell you what I read to my kids now. When I, I, I really liked uh, sneaking into the library to the V.C. Andrews section when I was a kid because right. it seemed kind of off limits. I'll right. go with that. Right. Okay. We'll do that. Uh, was there a book in high school, college that really stayed with you that um, either just is in your brain or influenced you as a writer? 
Uh, a movable feast. Okay. Uh, what book that you've read that you wish you had written? I wish I had written. Oof, gone girl. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what fictional world of a book would you want to live in, at least for a little while? Hmm. You know, that's hard for me because I really, I like, I like writing about the world we're in. Mm. So I think we're, we're here. Reality, yeah. Yep. Okay. What's the last book that made you laugh or cry? Laugh or cry. Um, well, it was a book about Prince. <laughs> Sorry. All right. I saw him when I was nine years old. Um, so I'm kind of a super fan and yeah. I was pretty bummed by that he died. Yeah. And it made me laugh and cry. Right. Okay. All right. What would you call your guilty pleasure read? A book about Prince. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is acceptable. Um, everybody has a book that they have fake read. What's yours? Fake read. Oh, well, you know, I have to be honest. I could list on any number of those because I don't know what they what, what I read in high school besides Beowulf but I did not I didn't read Pride and Prejudice I didn't read mm. like you name it right but you could say Beowulf I mean that's well, that's one that a lot of people answer that they fake read so <laughs> I think you get credit for that um how many pages do you give a book before you just put it down because you can't finish it uh, about I'll say a chapter oh wow okay unless it's a long chapter right all yeah. right what was the last book you gave as a gift uh, my book I sent to a kind man who I do not know in Pennsylvania who contacted me on my website after reading the NBC thing I did and wanted to give me advice about diet stuff for MS. Hmm. All right. I just thought that was really nice. Yeah. Well, there's technology influencing your life. There you go. Writer, right? Yes. Okay. There's technology. What are the favorite books that you read with your children, the ones you curl up and enjoy together? Homer. It's a book about a dog who yep. sits on a porch. You know that one. Um, my daughter likes scary stuff, so we have the spooky stories collection that she likes to read. Um, and I think my favorite book is that I read with them is um, oh, I can, so I just got the version that's in Spanish and English, so now I can't remember the, what the name of the title is. But it's um, you are my I love you. Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we are out of time, but we want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to sharing your book with even more readers. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great interview with author Teresa Schweigel, author of The Lies We Tell. We're always happy to support local Chicago authors, and this one's even set in Chicago. Thanks for joining us on Authors Revealed. Mm -hmm.